now streaming. Mm, it's still setting up. Redirecting to Facebook Live. Good evening. Um, my name is Trudy Goldsmith, and I'm a co-chair of the English Programming Committee of the Jewish Public Library. Good evening to all of you, bonsoir and shalom to all the friends of the Jewish Public Library and welcome to our second literary salon and uh, for this evening and to our guest Marianne Ackermann. She is originally from Ontario and she has been a very active part of the Montreal art scene since 1980. She has published three novels, two books of short stories, and she has created more than a dozen plays for the stage. She was a co-founder and artistic director of Theatre 1774 for a decade in the 1990s. Her new book, Triplex Nervosa Trilogy, is published by Guernica Editions this spring. And she's here to tell us all about it. Welcome, Marianne. And as we say in the world of theater communication, toy, toy, toy. We are looking forward to have you here. Thank you very much, Trudis, for this wonderful invitation into the Jewish Public Library. It's really an honor to be here. It's lovely in these times to have an opportunity to get dressed and think that I'm actually going out, which of course I'm not, but that's all right. Tough times for everybody. Uh, I think I send out a big heart felt sympathy for everyone who's toiling very hard on the front lines of this crisis. We're only asked to stay home and lament our lost lives, which is fine. That's our mission. We have to do it. So it takes away a little bit of my, my fear and chagrin launching a new book. Okay, I have to do this because we have to carry on. So I really appreciate this opportunity to come out and talk. Uh, the book I'm talking about tonight is Triplex Nervosa Trilogy, Guernica Editions. Uh, many, many people viewing, I suspect, might have seen the original play at the Centaur in 2015. Triplex Nervosa, it was on the Centaur season. Um, it did very well, 9,000 people saw it, so I was very, very happy to have that success and a wonderful cast of seven Montreal actors, Roy Surrett directing. The, the original play, it's, it's a comedy, people laughed, but it also has some very, very dark themes. I wrote the play at a time when I was actually, as I explained in the introduction, I was kind of at a mixed, a, a crossroads of feeling really bad and actually feeling kind of liberated by certain problems. So that's what it came out as being sweet and sour. Um, it's set in the Maya land, which many of your listeners will think of as just the main the place around the main. Mordecai Ritzer was born on Esplanade. There's so many great writers in these storied streets. It is, of course, an immigrant heartland of Montreal in the north, north part of the plateau. But this play is set in a mile end that people who've left won't necessarily know. It's the mile end of the 21st century where it became, this neighborhood became, and to some extent still is, a, a popular music hub a kind of creative um, area with Casa del Popolo and so many bands coming up and making great music. Uh, and, and Arcade Fire, for example, hugely famous international band started out here. Patrick Watson, who's one of my favorites, he's, his music I chose to have, it inspired me in writing the play, but it also was part of the Centaur production. So I've gone ahead and in publishing the play, I've made um, you know notes of all the songs that are played at what point. So if you want to go on online and find him, you can definitely uh, get a flavor of the of the neighborhood. So I guess with writing this play, I want to take my place in this great historic neighborhood that has given so many generations um, a wonderful life, the Mile End. The central character is Tas Nazor. She's early twenties, so obviously a kind of figment of my imagination or an alter ego, early 20s. She was a cellist at a young age, a bit of a virtuoso, but gave it up 
to buy a triplex on my land, which uh, everybody will know is it's one of these three story buildings and row houses. This beautiful old building needs a lot of work. She's put everything into it. And as the play opens, it's 2008, fall of 2008, the Lehman Brothers have gone bankrupt, the crashes has happened and people are in a pandemic of financial meltdown. All of her credit cards are maxed out. She's in danger of losing the building. She's about to renew and the mortgage rates will be outrageous. So she's in, in deep trouble. And in the opening scene, she and her handyman, Racky Ur, an East European immigrant, supposedly, she and Racky brainstorm about how they could make the tenant on the third floor's life a little less comfortable so that he would get out because he's been hanging on for a year after he was paid to get out, he's still there. And they need him out so they can renovate and get a market price for the building. And so she tried, they decide on a couple of strategies that they will try. It goes terribly wrong, tragically wrong. And the rest of the play is Tass and Racky scrambling to get themselves out of the trouble they get into with this terrible accident. Now, in this series of three plays, which there's a sequel, nobody, people die, but they never leave the play. So we don't lose sight of the characters who don't make it to act two or to play two. But it just, it's, it's a world of itself. I wanted to create um, a world of recognizable characters who would always be centered around this one piece of real estate in the Mile End. One of them being Reb Klein, a Hasidic Jewish guy who, father of nine daughters, who lives across the street and who owned the building before Tass. But he too got into, uh, he's more for studying and praying and he got into financial trouble. So he was forced to sell to her. He had promised to do all kinds of renovations in terms of the sale, but he's dragging it out because he really likes Tass and he loves the building and he is a fatherly figure watching over her. So they develop this relationship of him procrastinating and her being desperate. And he then is involved in the kind of crisis of the loss of the building. And anyway, I won't want to give the plot away, but um, it's a play about the rediscovery of a passion and the kind of alternate family for Tass. So the play was very successful and I, I saw that it touched all generations and there's different generations in the play. So it wasn't just the Mile End music crowd, it was um, my generation as well because we're well represented by characters who tell the younger ones what they should do with their lives. So I decided to write a sequel and I took my favorite character, Reb Klein. I decided, okay, he has to die. And then we'll deal with it. We'll, we'll deal with Rep Klein after he dies. So I wrote the other two plays, which are in the book as well. In 2018, the Blue Metropolis Literary Festival gave me an opportunity to do a staged reading of the first act of Rooftop Eden, which is the second play. So I prepared my, I took a little excerpt from that. I want to let you to hear um, a staged reading of one scene. In this scene, Racky, so it's six years after the first play and Racky and Tass are a couple. They have a daughter. They're living in one of the units. Um, Tass is holding a major memorial, inviting all the characters from the earlier plays back to memorialize Reb Klein and try to, you know, which is one of the themes of the play of how we grieve and how we get over and how we, we cope with the loss of someone. So she feels by bringing everybody back together, even though ironically they were caused her a lot of trouble when they were around, but bring them all back for this great feast of a dinner. Uh, it will be a good thing and she will get the kind of karma that the good feeling that Rep Klein always gave her by being there for her because she deeply, deeply misses them and she feels guilty and all that. So the whole day from the early morning and the dinner is at seven at night and the whole dinner party lasts until three in the morning. So it's kind of a 24 hour day. So this scene shows very early in the day when Raki, her East European boyfriend is alone with her mother, Dragija, and they're getting ready to help Tass. So the, the mother lives in a basement suite. She's Croatian. She's everybody's uh, immigrant mom. And anyway, let's just hear what they have to say. I'd just like to say further, Dragija is my good friend and a wonderful performer writer, Anna Furstenberg. Raki, uh, played by Carl Grabocious, Tass by Alison Lauder. Stage directions read by Paul Van Dyke. So here's a little theme with music to start off with, not by Patrick Watson, but by Josh Dolgan, who is a, a, a rapper, klezmer 
rapper uh, called So Called is his stage name. So that's the music to start off with. Gives you a sense of Myland. He's a Mylander too. Ground floor apartment, nicely renovated, family photos on the wall. Enter Racky, carrying a coffee mug, wearing a bathrobe and a tool belt. He is listening to music on headphones. He goes into the kitchen, brings out various tools and reno materials. Enter from the basement suite, Dragasha. She is stout and uses a cane, though rarely touches the floor. She notices a lamp is on, turns it off, watches Racky speaks to him, but neither he nor the audience hears her over the music. She thumps her cane on the floor. Finally, she jabs him in a friendly way. He removes the headphones, killing the music. Yo, gospoda nazor, dobro jutro. Dobro jutro, cinemai. Um, kakosi? Oh, my boże. Ne ma go spavite. Boli mi glava. Umnire, umnire, braki. Neka nam bo promenne. Moli, moli, please, baka nazor. My Croatian is not so good. Da, dobro godo. Uh, you are kind, but uh, you are not fooling me. I, I will continue to learn Croatian language with your help. Why? You have big country, no need for small language. Uh, but your language is uh, Jakoliev. Jakoliev. <sighs> Where is my daughter? Uh, she is taking Ella to school, uh, then to shopping and uh, hairdresser. Ah, yes. Tonight is memorial for Jewish men. The Red Klein. Ella will stay with me, sleep downstairs. I make for her supper. Racky saw us through a board, creating noise and sawdust. Dragisha watches, skeptical. She picks up the paper sketch of his plan, studies it. Using the measuring tape, she checks the length and shakes her head. Uh, too long? Too short. What for the sobbing? Oh, a kitchen remodel. Ah, now, day of memorial? I am building shelves, a surprise for Tess. Why you have need of kitchen? My daughter is bad cold. No. Uh, she never is cooking. She is not uh, traditional like you, but today she will prepare a feast. Oh, my God, Nema, you are a good man, Raki. Dover Chaviak, not like Croatian men, wicked apes. All of them. Thank you. My Tasia is lucky. Does she know this? Nah. Does she listen to me? Nay. Why is such a party? He is dead three months. Tass is taking the death of Reb Klein badly. Memorial will help her to feel better. You will see. Tass approaches carrying shopping. Dragasha hastily disappears downstairs. Enter Tass. Hi, honey. What have you been up to? Oh, uh, just brushing up on my Croatian with your mom. Racky! I'm putting up the kitchen shelves like you wanted. Honey, the memorial's tonight. I know, but since I took the day off, I thought, why not get it? No, started. you didn't think you forge ahead. Ugh, you always do this. What? Start a project at the wrong time and don't finish it. What? The front steps. Look, since my promotion, I've oh, had... yes, the famous promotion stop the world. Her cell phone rings. Hello. Ah, bonjour, Germaine. Comment ça va? Oui, oui, fantastique. Ah, bon, OK, à cette heure. Um, Germaine Tremblay? She got out of her other commitment. She's coming to the memorial. You're kidding. She had tickets to the Habs game. Did you get more candles? It's the Eastern Finals, Habs versus the Lightning. Try it all around. You know, the Canadians have to win or we're out of the playoffs. Don't tell me you expect to watch hockey tonight. No. Take the game. Watch it tomorrow. The score will be known. How can I cheer for a game that's already happened? It's a live thing. A game like that has to be seen by live fans. Okay. The game is dead. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, that's it. So that's the scene that sets up everything that's going to happen after that. And um, we learn in the rest of this day, Tass learns a lot about herself, about uh, revelations from her mother, about her past, and it ties the Rep Klein story together with Tass's strange relationship that she's had with this man for six years. So it's kind of a father figure story that she had some kind of, they both had some kind of intuition. They were somehow uh, meant to be together. And no, he's not her fa real father, but you know, I won't spoil the revelation. But I will say that themes of identity are very prominent in this story. Uh, you, you see that Raki doesn't actually have an East European accent. He certainly doesn't have a Croatian accent, but he's one of these people who's always plunging into other cultures and finding himself through them. So that's part of the joke of the play. And I guess it's a theme that I've been writing about for a very long time as a, a, an immigrant to Montreal from Ontario, this strange notion of identity and purity and the surprises that come when you learn about other cultures and what you learn about yourself. So yeah, Jewish identity is definitely one of the themes in the play. So, so although I'm actually not Jewish, but there are many other identities. And, um, you know, I do feel that Jewish culture is so, so prevalent and so in our bones and so much of our, of our culture that I don't think it's anything that just, um, that any more can be seen as it is definitely Jewish identity, but Jewish culture is our so much a part of our own Western culture now that um, I don't think it's a question of um, a heritage that is exclusive, exclusive to anybody. It's um, part of our common, a common sensibility, our sense of humor, our sense of many things. So that's why for me, to be able to write a play about this strange multicultural situation of Mile End and actually to maybe kind of laugh about it a little bit, which was pretty shocking. I know I entered this play in a contest uh, early on after it was written and um, I did win a reading in this contest and the, the, the director who runs the thing said, well, we had some debate about your anti-Semitism, you know, with this Jewish Hasidic guy on stage and how that's gonna be taken. You know, there will be complaints and we will be expecting to hear people protest and that and what you're kind of laughing. And I said, well, I don't think that I meant anything other than a warm and affectionate relationship to him. So I must say that I found when the play was on and the character of Reb Klein was put, played by Danny Brochu, who is not at all Jewish, but was just amazing. And I said, you know, with, from the beginning, you have to be fully yourself. It can't be some stereotype that you picked up out of watching TV. It has to be, you know, a real character and just follow the lines and follow the line of the character. And after this play came on in 2015, I swear to you, I've seen three or four plays in Montreal with Hasidic Jewish people in it. And now, of course, we've got this huge burst on Netflix. We've got um, uh, Unorthodox. We've got um, Schnezel, this wonderful, Israeli show so now it's almost like it's it's ordinary it's it's common but as early as as recently as 2014 15 13 I had um, people thought that maybe to put a Hasidic Jew in a play would be considered controversial I don't think so but anyway <laughs> so um the play also has um uh, I did write um, quite a substantial introduction to the play called Where Do Plays Come From? Where Do They Go? Which talks a bit about uh, the idea of the play, where I got it. And this, I'd started out, talk about starting out to write, I was planning to write a novel with a murder in it set in Mile End, because as you know, there's so many murder mysteries selling and there seems to be an insatiable public demand for murder mysteries where I personally cannot really think of anything new to say about murder. So I started writing a novel and then I started writing dialogue and the play just poured out. So I decided, okay, this idea is a play, not a novel, although it could have been a novel, but uh, I feel that with, uh, I've got a total of 20 characters. Uh, the play runs over six or seven years. 
So my next step is to try and see if I could get any interest in maybe a television series. I mean, I think it's, it's got the music angle. And I think that there's, as I think about these characters, um, in a play, you have to be very compressed. You have to compress the action. And I tried with Rooftop Eden to put it all in one 24 hour period, which of course is the ideal Aristotelian model. It's all one day. Um, the third play called Famously is what happens after Rooftop Eden. It stretches over seven or eight months in Tass's life. And it's the leap where she goes from being a mom with one and then two kids. And she's also competing in an international cello comp competition at pretty well the same time that she's giving birth. So I, I collided the seminal experiences in a young woman's life uh, in a farcical way and see every bad thing that could happen to her over this. And how would she actually use the difficulties of her life to not to, to, to far from stopping her from being a great, uh, artist and playing well in the competition would actually feed her drive and her ability to be clear and brilliant. So I guess that would be my, my grandmotherly uh, message over the plays is that the generations have a lot to say to each other. It's all very well for young girls to go and get all these books and listen to Gwyneth Paltrow. And there's a lot of information on the web about how to live your life and how to be the best you you can be. But I do believe that people you know from your own context and maybe even your own bloodline, people you know who've been there have a few things to say that might be useful to you and might be completely, will be completely devoid of spin and capitalism. So that's sort of my mission at the moment in a part of my mission as a writer is to not so much self-expression. This play doesn't really... It's not something I need to write or needed to write to find out what I think. It's something I wanted as a gift to my land or to Montreal. Okay, this is what I've seen, what I can put together and let me go with these people. And this is what I feel that they have to say and me say through them. So that's Triplex Nervosa Trilogy. Um, my dear publishers, Connie McPartland, who's a Montrealer, Mike Marola, former Montreal, now living in uh, Hamilton, they are publishers of this wonderful company, Guernica Editions. It's a labor of love. And for me to talk them into publishing a trilogy of plays, <laughs> it took some doing. I mean, it's kind of like I'm bended knee. I said, Give, I'm going to buy two boxes of them and I'm going to sell them myself if I have to go on the street corner. I swear you won't go bankrupt. So if you'd like to get a copy of this for $20, postage included, go on Facebook, message me, and we'll, we'll strike the terms and I'll send it out. So this is very much a mile end project. And um, while I dream of big things, uh, of it being um, some kind of a television series, what I'd like right now is when you have the time to try reading a play, that this be the play you try. So thank you. That's pretty well all I have to say. Any questions would be okay, but uh, otherwise, much appreciated. First of all, I would like to <clears throat> thank you. Um, and then I also would like to thank Roxana of the Jewish Public Library, our director of programming, you have, who has been able to convince you to join us and spend the evening with us and tell you something about um, this new book. And I was wondering when I read the title, Triplex Nervosa Trilogy. First of all, it made me nervous. I said, hmm, what's going to happen here? And then I wondered, did you choose the title or did your publisher choose the title? Because this is always a very important mm -hmm. tool, uh, a sale tool also, because the title uh, it gives you an indication of where you mm -hmm. would want to go in the book. Yes. That's the first question mm -hmm. I have. I must say, I didn't, unfortunately, I did not see the play. I love the Sand Tower, but there was a time when I was more in Germany than here, when mm -hmm. it came to creative mm -hmm. theater courses. But I will definitely want to read the book and give it to all my friends. Um, now, who chose the title? The title, I chose the title. When I was writing it, um, I, I, thought, I thought, of course, of Anorexia Nervosa, which is the 
the difficult, uh, it's a young woman's thing, anorexia nervosa, it seemed to me triplex nervosa would resonate with that generation, the millennial generation. So you'd think of that. And then when I played the three plays, I thought, well, that's the play that's known. So I'll, I, there's no point in giving it a, a second title. I'll just go with Triplex Nervosa trilogy. So it's really- Okay, it's, so it's it your choice. Yeah, the, and I wanted it to be edgy. Yeah, it's a- Yeah, because the, this is always forceful because very often the publishers will choose a title which sells better or, you know, which because it immediately you ask yourself, Triplex Nervosa. Mm -hmm trilogy mm -hmm. what is going to happen yes here? Mm -hmm. and um, it makes you curious that's one thing and then when you were talking about it right now because it's new unfortunately I didn't read anything before which I probably should have but um, I was only asked and invited to say hello and thank you um, just a day ago oh I was away from Montreal mm -hmm. and I came back now uh, what I f find fascinating too is the fact that it is set in the Myland, the 21st century. It's an area which shapes Montreal or has mm -hmm. shaped characters, has shaped the architecture, has shaped people's lives. I love the area. I mean, being from Europe, uh, you are drawn there. Um, it's also an area where you find Jewishness uh, minted into the stones, the buildings, the history. Mm -hmm. And for me, not being Jewish at all, being German and coming to Montreal in 1964 to McGill and get to know the city, but with a background of German Jewish studies, this area attracted me. And I think it's such a, a life, such a vivid, such a colorful, area that you want to get to know more about it, yes, especially mm -hmm. when you are an outsider. Mm -hmm. And you coming from Ontario, immediately I said, what does she know about Jewishness? Mm -hmm. What do I know about Jewishness? I unfortunately know the very tragic part mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. German history of the 20th century. But I also know um, theater directors, actors, plays, all the great names of 1900 to 1939 in Germany and German theaters. So for me to be here, the first place I had to look up was the Jewish Public Library. Mm -hmm. And it has been a treasure chest for me mm -hmm. because the archives, the material, the people, I didn't know Hebrew. I needed to read text. People translated it free of mm -hmm. charge of any of everything to get to know more about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is still my treasure chest and it's a home. It's mm -hmm. an intellectual home for me. Yes. But then again, for you, the question is uh, here, the question, how do you grieve an East European friend? How do you grieve a Jewish friend when you are not familiar with uh, grieving. Well, there's a scene in the play that actually deals with that. So Reb Klein's wife, who's never appeared before, she uh, uh, comes over during this 24 hour day with her daughter and they bring uh, a cake, some contribution. So there's a very awkward scene with Tass and uh, Sophia, Sophia uh, Klein, because Tass feels this, she's gotten to know a rep client. She's been to their house many times for tea, but always within a, a Hasidic home with the sort of rules and limitations. This is the first time that Sophia Klein has come into her house, which of course was where she lived in that very apartment. And she brings her pregnant daughter with her. She's having her first child. The girl is very distraught being back in the house because this was a house where they, and Sophia says, oh, my water broke right here. I had a child, I had my children in this apartment. It's so it's very touching. And then Mireille, the daughter, can't stand the conversation. She runs off. And um, it turns out that Sophia then tells her whole story. And she too has assumed this accent. She's spoken really only, um, you know, Yiddish and that the task would really see much of her. But she tells her story and she's actually went to, she was from Chicago. She's an American Jew, came here to marry Reb Klein uh, after her first husband died. So they have this whole conversation where <coughs> it's totally without accent. So we get to know her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then also what, 
does it not still make you sort of a stranger within that world of Jewish culture? I think of the Mile and I think of the people who settled there, the people who came first, the people who created the, the, the shuls, um, the synagogues. I mean, on these famous walks mm -hmm. through the city, I was able to discover some of those places. Mm -hmm. But how did you, how, how, I mean, what inspired you to, well, to go I mean, living way? here, it's interesting because, of course, I, I've known, I knew Harry Gulkin quite well. He was someone I saw frequently. I knew at one point Aaron Fish. I seem to have known um, Ted Allen was a very close friend at a certain time. I knew some of these seminal Jewish writers uh, and um I mean, I did get to know, I've been here since 1980. So I knew my land originally through the writers and some of the artists who had of course moved out to other neighborhoods. So here I was this writer, young writer living in the neighborhood where they grew up and they're living elsewhere. So that was one level. But then, um, you know, I, I did buy this apartment from a Hasidic Jewish guy and I kind of got to know him, but I don't pretend to know I'm very much the task character. She doesn't know them either. She's just trying to get away, get along with this house and that. So it's the people you meet. The great thing about a play, you're not asked to fill in all the background. The characters come in and be themselves. So as long as you've, uh, you know, got that more or less accurately, and I definitely did have um, people read it and say the whole Croatian thing, which is a big theme. Croatia is a very small uh, culture with 5,000 Croatians and that was for me more pro problematical than the Jewish because I didn't have any well I chose chose Croatian I wanted a non-controversial ethnic minority somebody without uh, okay. you know such yeah. a controversy to be the that's Tass and her mother as you saw has a very heavy Croatian accent and speaks a lot of Croatian in the play so I went to the Croatian community center I met the the priest I went to the Christmas ceremony I got to help me help the translations and that I did research Croatia and I had traveled to Croatia myself once for two or three weeks so I had a sense of of all that although it's not deep but um but with the Jewish no I don't feel uh I feel the permission to write about it comes from having lived here in Montreal in this neighborhood for 30 years and I'm not writing from the inside I'm writing I'm noticing and uh, and then after the play, you know, a lot of people saw it and nobody objected and we found it funny. So I think it's, um, I think that part of me is still a journalist. I feel the permission to observe and to write about what I see. And I don't worry too much because I'm not here to represent, um, you know, the Irish heritage that I have and all that. And possibly I have a Jewish heritage. I don't know. European from the Palatine region <laughs> could be, but uh, not that I know of. So but, but but you are <clears throat> sorry but you are a very interesting uh, mix excuse me to say that because you are um, a playwright you write uh, texts you write um, reviews um, and you have been doing that you have been a very vocal voice in in montreal on very mm -hmm. different levels how did you get your energy <laughs> how do you get your energy well, i mean i just i I don't do anything else. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think that I'm a very hard worker. I only publish a book every five years. I'm not one of these people who has a book out every year. You know, I'm always working on something and it's what I love doing. I do really wish, and this, I deal with this in the introduction. I wish that Montreal were more receptive to its own writers and not just me. I wish that people who had plays at the Centaur that did well would get a chance to do another one. I wish that the Gazette would cover more literature. I wish that during a pandemic, they didn't uh, put the book reviewer um, on layoff because books are still coming out and people are reading. Why do we have to read a page of sports every day when there are no sports happening? Mm -hmm. And yet we don't read about books when books are being read. I think that uh, it's very, very hard to be an, an Anglophone artist in Montreal. But by now, myself and anybody of my age or coming up has to realize you just keep doing it. And you pop up every once in a while with a book and you have some success in 2015 and then nothing for, you know, five years, or whatever. That's just the life of the artist here. Yes, yes. But on the plus side, there's a lot of great things to write about. So mm -hmm. there you go. It's a trade off. But, 
But you mentioned before that you um, would expect or would hope that uh, there may be a TV series. Did you? Speak well, I'm 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 writing a pilot. I'm going to put it around. I'm. Uh, I'm trying to get some traction on that. So I'd say maybe, I think it would make a, I've written a, an outline and I think that it's something I would like to put some energy. I'm not going to put any more energy into trying to get plays on at the Centaur. I don't understand what that theater is about. I don't understand their programming and uh, I'm going to stop worrying about it because I don't feel that I have a future there and very few Montreal writers have a future there. So we need to find other ways. And that's one of the good things in a weird way about this lockdown and pandemic is that we're forced to, everybody's in the same boat, more or less, who's trying to create, unless you're fighting for your life, you're fighting for, for your livelihood, one or the other. So I'm, this is very small, the Zoom connection and being able to speak to the friends of the Jewish public library. I don't even really think that would necessarily happen to me under normal circumstances, but suddenly, the Canada Council and the National Arts Centre and all kinds of organizations are saying, how can we get writers to be heard? And sure, the silent writers of Montreal are getting on the bandwagon, but maybe now we can, you know, kind of just take a step back and then plunge in and try to find other media for our work. Now that all the theaters in the country are closed, we should maybe consider the screen. Maybe that's our future. Yeah, I, I really think we should give credit to the Jewish Public Library and to Roxana, to Michael, to the staff, uh, to Maria, who leads us into these virtual literary salons, mm -hmm. and that they have chosen uh, purposely um, uh, Canadian, Montreal, I mean, mm -hmm. writers who live here, work here, depend on an audience, would like to share That's their excellent. Their precious gifts. Yes. And I think this is absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. because it probably would not have happened. We always do what mm -hmm. we can at the yes. library. But this is a whole series mm -hmm. which will continue. Excellent. And hopefully also at a time when people do take the time to sit down in this front of it. the screen mm -hmm. and see you, for example, talk about this new work. And also you have to tell us again or repeat again how we could get the mm -hmm. books now, because this is even difficult. You can't do it bookstore. Mm -hmm. You have to do it uh, one way or the other, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, like ordering food, but here it's <laughs> food for thought, creative mm -hmm. food. Yes. And, um, I. I really must say it is a beautiful idea. Uh, I was also touched yesterday. I joined a, a book club meeting of a McGill team of 12 women, and they are only reading for that year Canadian authors. And then yes. I said, but you are missing. You are missing British, you are missing German, you are missing Australian, you are missing whatever. And they said, well, that doesn't matter. They will be there. We want to know Canadian authors, what they write, what they do, what their horizon mm -hmm. is. And I found that fascinating. So I find um, yes, the yes. public library step into the direction to see you. I mean, we have seen you. That's excellent. It's very excellent. Really good. I hope it continues on and on. So. Yes, yes. I think it will. I think it will. Mm -hmm. I have to give them credit because also to give you mm -hmm. credit and um, those writers who have my pleasure on and have said they don't receive a honorarium. They don't. They do it because they love what they are mm -hmm. doing. They love mm -hmm. the craft. And I think this is very, very, very precious. Mm -hmm. I do not know what else to ask you. There are thousands of things. Well, you just want to know uh, where you can get the book. You can get the book on yeah. Chapters Indigo online. Very good. Uh, you can get it from the publisher, mm -hmm. or you could get it from me. If you go on Facebook, Marianne Ackerman, you can go just click on it and see message. Send me a message, and we'll deal with it. I've got a stack of them here. I can mail them out, and we can... I can sell it to you directly or whichever you feel comfortable with. But yeah, uh, because there are, there are birthdays coming up. There are all kinds of celebrations mm -hmm. coming up. And I think there's nothing better than giving a book from a Montreal author to some of our friends or even two of them. They can handle more than just one. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find, do I have more to ask? I don't know. 
it's also generated. Well, I love the idea, the mile end idea, the flavor of the neighborhood, this, this whole, and also um, the way you spoke about the female characters. Um, Rocky happens to be the name of my second son. So he has already a place in my heart. I will, <laughs> I will have to get the book in any case. But is there anything else you would like to tell us? No, I think that's fine. That's uh, you've covered everything. It's wonderful. So okay. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you to come to us to share your spirit, your creative force with us, um, your time, your thank ideas. You. Thank and you very much for having me. Much appreciated. And thank Roxana for having the idea and Maria to guide us through everything because nothing would have worked if she were not on, on our side. So, so thanks very, 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 very much.